Hi, I'm Seth Myers. The crisis our country is going through is at its heart about anger and frustration in the black community. Over years of mistreatment by law enforcement, this week as Americans came together to protest, we opened each show with late night writer Amber Ruffin telling her personal stories about her interactions with the police. They're profoundly powerful. They're profoundly eye-opening. We gathered all four here. Let me tell you a story. So once when I was a teenager, I was brand new to driving and I dropped my friend off at work and I'm coming back home and I'm in morning rush hour traffic and everybody is going over the speed limit. I think it's like 40 and everyone is going 50 and I hate it because I'm new to driving. It's too scary. When I slow down, it disrupts traffic. So I speed up to 45. That's five miles over the speed limit. That's as fast as I'm willing to go. Um, and I know I'm going too slow and I'm in an unfamiliar part of town and people are whizzing by me. So to make myself feel better, I turn on Busta Rhymes and I friggin' blast it so that, um, you know, I can calm down and b blasting Busta Rhymes is something that I recommend if you're a teenager who is unsure of themselves. So I get to a good pace and I start feeling normal. And just then I encounter a speed trap and no one is slowing down. We are all speeding, um, me least of all. So to my right, there is an old white cop standing on the side of the road. And out of these tens of cars, he sees a young black person driving a purple car blasting rap music. And he chooses me and he's screaming at me. He is shouting as if I have murdered someone. Like on a scale of one to 10, he is at a 27 and he goes, Pull the car over! Pull the goddamn car over right now, mother That is what this cop is screaming at me. And I think this is how I die. This man is going to kill me. And I start crying. I am bawling because I am 100% sure that this man is going to drag me out of my car, beat me to death, and, you know, tomorrow on the news, everyone will be like, she didn't seem angry, but who knows? So I pull over and I stop. He goes, pull over the car. He's shouting. It does not stop. So he gets up to the car and he puts his hand on the door and he goes to um, start yelling and he sees me. He sees a teenage girl whose um, face is wet with tears and I'm just braced trying to think of all the good things that have happened in my life so that I get to heaven thankful instead of angry. And he looks me in the eye and he um, drops it and goes, oh, okay, well, uh, just, it's okay. Just let me have your ID. And, you know, he's taken aback. He goes from a 27 to a negative two. His whole demeanor changes. And it's as if he wasn't the guy who was just, screaming at me he's a totally different guy all of a sudden he's nice so um i give him my id he sends me on my way without a warning because once he saw a teenage girl <laughs> shouting was no longer fun uh look i have a thousand stories like this the cops have pulled a gun on me the cops have followed me to my own home and Every black person I know has a few stories like that. Many have more than a few. Black people leave the house every day knowing that at any time we could get murdered by the police. It's a lot. And sometimes when you see news footage like we have seen the past week and you hear people chalking it up to a few bad apples instead of how corrupt an entire system is, it becomes too much. And that's what I wanted to say. And I wanted to end this with something hopeful to, you know, provide some comfort, but maybe it's time to get uncomfortable. Last night, I told you a story about an encounter I had with police. Um, now let me tell you another story. One time, a few years ago, I was living in Amsterdam and I flew to Chicago for the weekend to visit some friends who live there. When I got there, my friend Jeff and I hopped in his car and headed out to pick up our friend Krasny, who just so happened to live next to the alley um, behind the police station. So 
Jeff parks his car at the gas station at the end of the alley so that I can run out, go pick up Krasny, and take her back to the car. I'm friggin' thrilled. I hadn't seen her in years. So uh, we were all going to go have dinner and catch up. Now, I get out of the car and go down the alley, and because Jeff is watching me, I skip down the alley to her house to make him laugh, you know? But little did I know, skipping down a police station alley is a big no-no because I end up skipping towards a cop car that's driving at me down the alley. The sirens go off, a cop gets out and his gun is drawn and he goes, put your hands on the hood of the car, put your hands on the hood. This man is furious. Uh, I comply and his partner pats me down. Um, now this man is livid. It makes no sense. His anger level towards me is insane. I'm a young, adorable delight, literally skipping down the street and I've infuriated him. So this man asked me, where are you coming from? And I go, Amsterdam. Now this answer enrages him. And he goes, no, where are you coming from right now? Where are you coming from? And I go, from the airport, from a flight, from Amsterdam. And he goes, why in the world are you running down this alley? I go, I'm not running, I'm skipping. I'm happy to be back in town. I'm going to pick up my friend Krasny and take her back to Jeff's car. And we're all gonna go catch up over dinner. And I remember, oh, thank God, Jeff is here. I gesture back to Jeff. Jeff is standing uh, outside of his car, just watching all of this. And he goes, so the cop and I see Jeff. And thank God Jeff didn't come running up to us because he could have gotten us bow shot. But the cop sees that Jeff, a white man, has seen all of this. And he changes his attitude with the quickness. He's suddenly professional instead of antagonistic. And he tells me that I was wrong for running. And it takes everything in me not to tell him that if I wanted to run down the alley, that that would be perfectly legal. So instead, I also gently remind him that I was not running, I was skipping. So the cop gets in his car and he leaves. And I walk to Krasny's house. I get her. Um, we take her back to the car. Jeff is really bothered by what happens, but I'm not. That man could have shot me in a second. People who know me would be running around talking about attacking an officer doesn't seem like something Amber would do, but the officer said she did. So that has to be what happened. So the second I see Krasny, I feel a lot better. And we go and we have a lot of fun that night. And if you think about it, it's kind of my duty to have fun because at any time, I could get murdered by the police. Now, every black person I know has stories like that. It's crazy that people don't run around telling everyone these stories all the time, but there's this unspoken rule that black people are supposed to take it in stride. Can you imagine having someone pull a gun on you and being expected to take it in stride? Now imagine a bunch of incidents like that over one lifetime. Multiply that by 43 million African Americans. And that is why things are like this right now. That is why people are angry. And if you're not angry, why not? The last two days I've told stories about my run-ins with the cops. Today I'm going to tell you a story about a run-in with the cops. Okay, I was living in Chicago and my friend Anthony had just left my house. Now, he goes out the door, across the porch, down the stairs, gets on his bike and rides away. I shut the door, I go inside, I change into my pajamas and when I come out of my room, I see that he has left his wallet. So I call him, he comes back to get it. I step out onto the porch with no shoes in my pajamas and instead of walking to the end of the porch and down the stairs, I just reach over the side of the porch to give him his wallet back. So he rides up on his bicycle 
and just lets his bicycle fall and then reaches up to get his wallet. Now at that moment, I'm reaching down and he's reaching up. Uh, a cop car pulls up, it flashes its lights. The cop gets out and she's like, hold it right there. We got you. <laughs> like, okay. Now everything she says to us, she says with her hand on her gun. Now I'm terrified because while I'm a black lady, Anthony is a black man and this cop is a tiny little white lady. Now I'm scared. Anthony's scared. I've had a lot of run-ins with the cops at this point. And isn't it hilarious that when people say run-ins with the cops, they mean they got caught doing something. But when I say it, I just mean being a person that they bother. Okay. So this cop says, why were you guys running from the police? And we're like, we're not, I'm not running anywhere. I live here. And she's like, okay. Meanwhile, I'm like, bitch, I have no shoes on. I don't say that. I say, I'm in my pajamas with no shoes on. And she goes, let me see both your IDs. I go, okay, but to get my ID, I have to go in the house. Okay. And she's like, fine. So I go in the house. And um, the whole time I'm in the house, she's asking Anthony a million questions. So I come up, I give her my ID. She says, this address is from Nebraska. And she's right. I go, oh yeah, I don't have a new uh, Chicago ID yet. And she goes, well, then I need proof you live here. Go get some mail. Now, this is where the story takes a turn. And I can't describe it exactly, except to say, now she has unsnapped that thing that holds your gun in place and is holding on to her gun tighter. So I go inside and I'm freaking out because she's going to shoot my friend Anthony for just being bigger than her. So I go in and I um, tear up the house looking for a piece of mail with my name on it, but I've just moved there. So I don't really have any. So I go, I get the mail, I come out and for some reason she has calmed down. I give her the mail. She looks at the mail. And she looks at us and she goes, okay, well, from now on, when I tell you to stop, you stop. Now, remember, she's never told us to stop anything. And I look at Anthony like, oh my God, how are you going to handle this cop lying on us? And he looks at me and he looks at the cop and he goes, okay. And I look at him and I go, okay. And we live to get harassed another day. Because that's the kind of thing you have to do to stay alive when you're black. You have to let the police lie to you at your own house. That's it. That's my story. Uh, we used to open this show with fun jokes, but for the last three days, we've opened the show with stories about me getting mistreated by the cops. And if you're tired of hearing these stories, do something. For the past three days, we have opened late night with me telling a story about run-ins with the cops. And tonight, I'm out of stories. Just kidding, I have more. A few years ago, I'm in the car with my white friend. He's a white man in a suit. He's just gotten off of work. Now, I'm in a head-to-toe velvet outfit because I'm great. Um, I think I was going to a party so it was like my favorite party outfit. I still remember that thing. It was beautiful. Um, it was uh, not that late at night. So we're at a truck stop seeing if my friend's dad, who is a truck driver, is there. We're driving slowly along the semi trucks looking for his dad's license plate. So I can see why we may have seemed suspicious. And a cop comes up and he taps on the window. And I'm like, Frick, I have been harassed for doing nothing. I'm sure this guy's gonna get us. My friend rolls down the window and the cop is super nice. Now I had never been stopped by a cop while a white man was around. And the respect this cop had for this white man in the suit, man, uh, this cop wants to know what in the world we are doing. And he asks politely and we tell him and he is unsatisfied. He goes, 
I stopped you because there's been a lot of prostitution. And I go, oh, I'm not a prostitute. <laughs> this cop has never believed anything less. He looks at our IDs and he asks us more questions. And my white friend is getting annoyed at this cop. And the cop can tell. But I'm like, oh my gosh, please just calm down and be cool. My friend says to the cop, he goes, you have nothing. You have to let us go. And I'm like, you just got me killed. But the cop goes, okay, but you have to leave. Okay. And that was it. My friend was like, she's not a prostitute. And I was like, oh, shut up. Hey, we're going. Thank you. Goodbye. Y'all, the respect this cop just automatically had for my friend, I'll never forget seeing it. So that's it. That's my story. Uh, all right. So um, for the past 10 days, the George Floyd protests were worldwide. Like hundreds of thousands of people all over the country, all over the world, saw yet another video of a man being murdered in cold blood and rose up. People all over the world took to the streets because they believe that black people deserve better treatment than we have been getting. And you know, I'm not like, oh wow, everything's over, everything is fixed, but Y'all, I am so shocked that so many people showed up for black people. Uh, we've been being discriminated against for fun for years. And I, I didn't think people cared or saw or they knew and were fine with it. Um, for whatever reason, everyone is fed up. Thank God. Um, and last night, Obama held a town hall and he talked about a comprehensive plan with real policies that can start saving lives right now. He talked about easy things that every police force in America can choose to do this second and start saving lives th this minute. This change, if they enact it, would be great. But please don't forget that it cost us not only George Floyd's life, but the lives of 11 people who have been killed during these protests, including David McAtee, Dave Patrick Underwood, Chris Beatty, Dorian Murrell, Italia Kelly, Calvin Horton Jr., Javar Harrell, Victor Cazares, Sean Monterosa, David Dorn, and from my hometown of Omaha, Nebraska, the brave James Skurlock. Don't let it cost more lives. Vote. I don't want to do it again. Vote. Call your representatives unfriend racists, and most importantly, when you see something, say something, do something, get loud. Don't let people get away with racist crap. Not anymore. It's a new day.